Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you in part by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Ben Hobbs and I will be your host today. Remember that you can ask questions at any point by using the Q&A which is located in the bottom center of your screen and typing your questions into the pop-up window. And I will relay these questions to our guests during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you see a question in there that you would also like the answer to, you can prioritize it by clicking the thumbs up icon just below their question. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Scott Hamilton, Professor and Chair in the Department of Anthropology at Lakehead University. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Hamilton. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you and uh, welcome to all of the people who are listening in. I hope you've got your questions ready. Um, what I want to talk about is how archaeologists take a look at aspects of Canadian Indigenous culture and history. And it's way too complex and way too long to try and address in this presentation. So I want to focus upon some of the information that we have about the first people in North America, specifically in Northern Canada, and then focus on the cultures of the subarctic and perhaps some of the cultures of the Northern Plains. And so they can see my map, my first slide now. Um, no, we'll have to get you to share oh, your screen again. Oh, uh, forgot a step. Okay, we're good to go now. Um, oh. Perfect. Okay, so what we see on this first map is North America divided into a series of regions. And I'm going to focus upon two, specifically the subarctic region in here, and also the Northeastern Plains region in this area. Um, I want to preface that by giving you some basic information about what we know about that ancient history and how we know about it, and then move on to some examples from the archaeological record. Uh, it's not moving forward. How do, oh, there we go. So, for archaeologists, the most important thing is the context of discovery. Um, we recover objects buried in the ground, but we also face a problem in trying to interpret what that might mean. And that requires us to be very careful to document what we see. We spend endless hours sketching, writing notes, taking photographs, uh, and increasingly, we're utilizing technology to try and make that job task a little bit easier. What we do know is that the Americas were probably occupied by humans for at least the last 15 to 18,000 years. And our best interpretation is that those early occupants arrived in the Americas from northern Siberia. Uh, at the height of the Ice Age. And they crossed from Asia to the Americas across the Bering Land Bridge that was exposed because sea levels were so much lower. North America was heavily glaciated until after about 14,000 years ago, where the ice slowly retreated northwards and eastwards towards the last remnant, of course, which is on Greenland. Now, as that ice retreated uh, northwards, populations who had arrived in the Americas during the height of the Ice Age were able to move northwards following the deglaciation northwards. And what they were encountering was a very different world from what we see now. Uh, this is an illustration of how paleoanthropologists and paleoecologists have interpreted that ancient past. You can see the major ice mass that's called the Laurentide Ice Sheet over a very significant part of northeastern Canada. This is after about two or three thousand years of deglaciation already. 
And to the south, we can see a series of different kinds of vegetation communities that are colonizing the deglaciated land. And I'm going to briefly talk about some of those early migrants who are moving northwards into that new land that are occurring in this area, in the Thunder Bay area on the west side of Lake Superior. Now at that time, Lake Superior was a much bigger version. We call it Glacial Lake Minong, which you can see here. And to the far west was even a bigger lake called Glacial Lake Agassiz, which you can see over here. And into this dry land between the two lakes, the first people started to move northwards into what is now Northern Ontario. And what they encountered was probably something like this at the very, very beginning after deglaciation. Lots and lots of oakwash plains that are probably mantled with tundra and stunted uh, shrubs. What kinds of animals were on that landscape is difficult to say, but certainly we should expect some of these varieties of critters. But this kind of landscape only persisted for a fairly short period of time, perhaps a few hundred years. And then as the sediments weathered and became more biologically viable, and as the climate warmed, that tundra landscape started to get occupied with coniferous forest or boreal forest. Now the sites that we look at in the Thunder Bay area dating this time period are located within this peninsula of dry land between the lakes and the ice. And quite a few of these sites are located with close to bedrock exposures of the right kind of stone for making stone tools. And here you can see a couple of illustrations of some of the kinds of projectile points that these folks utilized. Much of the early work that we see here in Thunder Bay is very much focused upon the shorelines of Glacial Lake Minong. And I'm going to point to a site right here on this narrow little peninsula called the Sibley Peninsula. The site's called the Brome Site. Now, what the Brome Site looks like now, as represented by the Google Earth image, is very different from what it looked like 9,000 years ago. This blue line that you see here represents the shoreline as it existed 9,500 years ago. And we think that the people who were utilizing this site were waiting here in ambush on this narrow little peninsula that connected this island to this mainland. And they were probably waiting and watching for caribou that would be migrating along this coastal shoreline or going across this spit onto the Sibley Island. And right at that narrow peninsula is where the hunters lay in wait, lay in ambush. As the centuries and the, and the millennia rolled by, deglaciation proceeded freeing up most of subarctic Canada for human settlement, probably by about seven or eight, uh, 7,000 years ago. And fairly shortly after deglaciation, people are moving northwards into this newly exposed landscape and making that land their homeland. Now, the subarctic is an enormous big chunk of land uh, dominated by bedrock, but also thickly forested with many, many, many thousands of lakes and rivers and wetlands. And the people who lived on this landscape lived a very mobile lifestyle. They pursued plants and animals as they became seasonally available. So they're always on the move, hunting and gathering. And because of that mobility, they needed a very lightweight and easily replaced tools and technology and housing. Probably the extended family was the primary social unit of these societies. So probably most of the time, most of the year, the people you lived with would be close relatives. 
probably grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles, cousins, and only in certain seasons, usually in places where food was abundant and predictable, these individual families would all come together and there would be a seasonal encampment. The technology we see is relatively sparse compared to the range of technologies that they utilized. This is because the soils do not preserve a lot of the organic materials well. So while we might see a relatively narrow range of stone and pottery and some metal objects in the archeological record, we should assume that there was a very, very diverse range of tools that these folks were making out of hide, out of bark, out of wood, out of antler, out of bone, and so on. Here are some other examples of the kinds of tools that we find archaeologically. This is a, about a 9,500 year old stone knife that's been chipped to produce sharp edges. This is about the same age, but it's a much rougher form tool. It's kind of a preform. It's a tool that would be finished as needed to either make a knife or a piercing tool. These are various kinds of copper artifacts that were produced probably beginning around 6,000 years ago. And that technology persisted up until probably about 2,000 years ago. In the Lake Superior region, we have exposures of native copper. And those ancient occupants were mining the copper out of the bedrock and then using a series of cold hammering techniques to make this diverse range of tools. Somewhere around 2000 years ago, we start to see pottery being produced and used. This particular pot probably dates somewhere between 400 and 1200 years old. These would have been used for cooking food and for storing food. Now the process of discovery is one quite frequently that involves testing in dense forest conditions. So you can see some of the archaeologists at work around the outside of this frame are doing what's called exploration archaeology. Uh, there is a proposed development down this road route and what we were doing was investigating whether there was archaeological deposits in the road of the road. And as you can see from the number and color and size of all of the dots, there's fairly substantial quantities of artifacts that are in the way that prevented construction of the road. The road couldn't be destruct, constructed because it would have destroyed the archaeological deposits. Now, the next series of slides that I want to talk about are talking about the ancient societies of the Northeastern Plains, specifically this area in the Northern Dakotas, Southern Manitoba and Southeastern Saskatchewan. And this area is quite different in terms of its archeology span and its adaptation. It's an extremely continental climate, which means that the summers are quite hot and the winters are very cold and there's limited precipitation. That means that most of this territory is open grassland, except in some specific places where it's sheltered and protected from the fires and where there's sufficient water to allow trees to grow. Throughout the grasslands, bison are the most important food source. And much of the culture and economy of the Great Plains is built around the hunting of bison. Now, that said, there are some societies in this area, in the Eastern Plains, that were also engaged in agriculture. Now, our image of the Great Plains is fairly stereotypic. We have images of horse-mounted warrior culture, uh, hunting bison or driving them off cliffs, living in skin-covered teepees, and dragging travois or 
carts without wheels as their means of mobility. But we gotta remember that horses are a relatively recent arrival in North America after they became extinct at the end of the Ice Age. So the horses we see are only here for about the last three or 400 years as a consequence of horses being reintroduced to the Americas after Spanish colonial expansion. Prior to that, the people of the Great Plains lived their lives by walking everywhere. Now bison being very important, were hunted in a number of different ways, depending upon the circumstance, the time of the year, and the nature of the landscape. This is one strategy. This is a very famous site in Southern Alberta called Head Smashed In. And it's one of the classic Plains bison jumping sites. And it operated by animals that are grazing out on this open plateau being driven up drive lanes and then stampeded so that they jump off the cliff and they fall to their deaths where people are then able to recover the animals and butcher them and process them for food and hides. This landscape is one of a number of ways that people hunted buffalo, but it's not the only way. The ones that I'm going to talk about here utilize much gentler slopes, as you can see with this series of illustrations, or people would sometimes drive the animals into corrals where they would be trapped and killed. This is one of those corral sites. This is a site in southwestern Manitoba where the corral is built into the edge of this little slough or wetland in this little valley that you see running through here. The encampment that's associated with the kill is located right here at letter B. Now we interpret this site to be very much like head smashed in, in that the animals are being driven into a trap that they can't see until it's too late. So this is kind of the view that the animals would have been seeing as they were being driven across this open prairie. You can see how the horizon provides them with no view of the valley beyond. And the bison pound or the bison corral is located just below the horizon, just below this arrow. And we envision it as kind of operating like this, where the animals are being driven into the valley that's hidden and then are becoming entrapped within this log corral. The excavations in the bison kill revealed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of animal bones and the projectile points that were used to kill them. In the encampment area, we see the sorts of activities that would be associated with the village working hard together in order to preserve the meat and the fat and the hides and the sinew that would build up a food surplus for later consumption. You can see the people carrying out all of these cooperative activities in the slide, but the archaeological residue is represented by tens of thousands of smashed buffalo bone fragments. This is because the animal bones themselves are very important because they're rich in fats and oils that's very important for the diet. We spend a lot of time trying to model how the landscape was utilized in order to undertake these kills. And this is a series of slides that are showing um, a bison kill site uh, far to the west on prairies that haven't been worked up. And because of that, we can see the rock drive lanes that are used to drive the animals into the trap. I've represented them here as white dashed lines. The kill is at A. Now what we've been doing is trying to get better quality mapping by flying a drone over top of this locality and then using it to produce higher resolution maps. So you can see these white dashed lines 
on the small scale map. But when you look at the large scale map produced with the drone, you can see these faint ridges here and here that represent the rock lines that were used to funnel the animals into the trap. Now the... Um, I might have to stop you there just so we have time to get to okay. some of the questions today. Um, sure. We've already got a lot of great questions in there. Okay, let's go to the questions. So I think I'll start with uh, Ms. Peterson's question and she is, or their classroom is wondering, um, if the glaciers interfered with the indigenous people's lives? Yes. Um, the, the uh, let me go to one of those maps. Um, nope. Oh, well, you have to share your screen again if you. Oh, okay. Um, so we see this great big ice cap. that dominated most of the landscape. And that landscape made it impossible for people to live on that land for obvious reasons. Um, but it also provided avenues for migration. You can see this black zone here that represented Beringia. All of that ice is sucking up a lot of moisture from the surface of the earth. It's resulting in sea levels declining very sharply. And therefore, the migration route would have been along the coastal plain off the Pacific coast and off the Atlantic coast that would have been kind of like a prehistoric superhighway, allowing people to migrate far to the south around the ice. And once they were south of the ice, then they could radiate out across the unglaciated parts of the continents and then pursue the ice northwards as it melted out and retreated northwards. But this pla these places are pretty much uninhabitable. We estimate that over the Great Lakes Basin, probably the ice was two or three kilometers thick. Uh Excellent. So our next question today comes from Jolene um, at Midnapur School, and she's wondering if there was a certain type of pottery that Indigenous people used, um, and if so, how did they make it? Uh, they are, there are a number of different varieties of pottery, and the shape and the decoration is distinctive to various cultural traditions. Um, most of this pottery is produced from a mix of native clays that have been cleaned and refined and frequently pulverized rock or sand will be added into it. That's because there's lots of impurities in this clay and as it's fired it causes the impurities to turn to a gas which cause the pot to blow up. So the the ground up rock and sand is acting as kind of a means of trying to release some of that internal pressure. Think of it as sort of like a reinforcing bar in concrete. Now the pottery is either produced by taking um, pieces of uh, prepared clay and sort of rolling it out like a snake and then using those coils to build the pot sort of like an igloo. And then other people are making pots by taking a textile bag that they've woven from native plant roots and use that as kind of a form. And they will use, uh, they'll take clay slabs and kind of smear it on the interior surface of the bag where the bag helps support the weight of the vessel as it's being constructed. Um, other forms of pottery production might involve any number of combinations of different production techniques, but this pottery is extremely sophisticated and complicated to make, and it represents a really significant effort in developing skills, figuring out the right combination of raw materials, uh, producing the pot, figuring out how hot the firing temperature has to be in order to uh, fire it to make a waterproof, fireproof vessel. 
Isabel and, and Brooklyn are wondering if we see these same type of tools all around the world, or is, just, is this something we only see in the Americas? Uh, we see variations on many of the same themes. Um, stone tools dominate the archaeological record up until maybe about five or six thousand years ago. Uh, pottery, the oldest pottery is probably seven or eight thousand years ago. In my part of North America, pottery was initially used about two thousand years ago. In southern Ontario and the eastern United States, maybe around 30 3,000 years ago, or maybe 3,400 years ago, was the beginnings of pottery production. Um, I mentioned the native copper that is produced in the Lake Superior region to make tools. It's occurring, that's occurring at about the same time that people in southwestern Asia were beginning to experiment with copper ores and smelting, defining the beginnings of the Copper Age in um, in Asia and Europe. They're experimenting with copper at the same time that Aboriginal people in Northern Ontario were experimenting with native copper that they're extracting from bedrock. How do we determine the date of an artifact like a tool? It depends on the local circumstance. In most archeology, span it relies upon a a method called radiocarbon dating. And that involves the archeologist recovering some kind of organic material that was living and laid down at about the time of interest that the archeologist is interested in. And within that organic material, when that, when that plant or animal was living, it was absorbing carbon from the environment. And that carbon consists of three different varieties. There's stable carbon-12, there's stable carbon-13, and there's radioactive carbon-14. After the animal dies, the two stable varieties of carbon remain in their standard abundance, but the radioactive carbon gradually disintegrates into other products, and what we are doing is counting how much of the radioactive carbon is left. Um, have we found any archaeological evidence um, that, it, that we've uncovered that uh, points towards um, any types of sports or games they may have played? Uh, yes, uh, the, the difficulty is that um, the archaeological record doesn't come with an instruction manual. So we see a lot of things that we can interpret function from, and then there will be all kinds of other things that we're really not certain what purpose they served. Some of them are certainly gaming pieces. Some of them might be uh, sacred objects. Uh, some of them might have special meaning for the person who produced and carried them but those meanings are lost. Uh, we do see in the ethnographic record and in the historic record, all kinds of indications that these ancient people had a wide range of games that they employed. How many of them would be preserved in the archeological record is hard to say. So we know that they were hunting animals, um, but do we know anything else about the indigenous people diet, people's diet? Yeah, um, we know that they were consuming a wide range of wild plant foods as well. Uh, fish, waterfowl, migratory waterfowl in particular, uh, terrestrial game animals were also important. And after about 2000 years ago, maybe 2500 years ago, we see the diffusion northwards of domesticated plants into what's now Canada. Some of those earliest of domesticated plants are plants that we now think of as kind of like weeds. So plants like ragweed were actually a very rich and important uh, food source that was domesticated and grown in ancient America. 
over the last 2,000 years, we see a series of tropical domestic plants that were originally domesticated in Mexico finding their way northwards and becoming integrated into the local economies. Uh, corn, beans, and squash are particularly important in both the eastern woodlands and in the eastern plains, but also in some parts of the subarctic. Andrew from uh, Mindapur School is wondering um, what, how they used to chip the stone to create that shape that allows it to be used as a tool or a weapon. Uh, there's two different techniques. One involves uh, the stone that you want to chip being struck by a hammer stone. This is called percussion flaking. It's sort of the same way that, you know, if you bang two rocks together, one of them will break. And these folks know how to strike the surface of the stone in order to get it to chip in the ways they want in order to produce sharp edges. In addition to percussion flaking that is used to get the rough shape of the tools that I was showing you earlier, um, you would get a rough blank and then you would shift to a different technique that involves using an antler tine or a splinter of bone. And it involves um, putting the tip of the antler tine right on the end of the surface that you want to sharpen and applying a lot of pressure to the point where the edge of the stone will fail and it'll chip and flake and produce a sharp edge. Carly from Miss Peterson's classroom is wondering how do artifacts stay preserved in the ground for hundreds of years? Often they don't. Uh, only certain artifacts will survive. The vast majority of what ancient people used is long disappeared into the soil. It breaks down into breakdown products as part of biological decay and gets recycled in plants and then in animals. Uh, so what we're left with are the stone objects that don't decay, the pottery, which is quite dense and hard, particularly after it's fired, sometimes metal objects, and very, very occasionally uh, bone objects. Most of the leather, the bark, the wood tools all decompose and disappear, except under very, very specific circumstances. Do we have any archaeological evidence um, that points to contact between indigenous peoples and the European settlers? Oh, yes. Uh, that's one of my areas of specialization. Um, the initial point of contact between many societies in the Americas, in, is certainly in northern North America, involved economic exchange through the fur trade. So the Europeans are arriving in the Americas, many of them, and seeking to harvest the furs. But they may not have the skills to hunt and trap the fur-bearing animals, so they would tr trade and exchange with the local experts. And what, they would, what the local experts would gain in exchange would be a range of different kinds of implements that would not be available to them otherwise. This might include metal such as iron and steel tools. It might include textiles made from wool, might include glass beads, might include a wide range of products of European manufacture. And in exchange, they would be providing the fur traders with skins, beaver pelts in particular, that would be highly valuable in Europe. A lot of that early contact derives from those commercial activities and also from intermarriage between Aboriginal and European societies. Well, we're almost out of time for today, um, but before we finished off, I was hoping to have you talk a little bit um, about your career path and maybe some advice for students who are considering something similar for themselves. Uh, my career path. Well, um, I started in archaeology quite young as a high school student uh, where I got a, a summertime job 
on an archaeological dig and got bitten by the bug and have been doing it fairly steadily since then. So I think this will be my 46th or 47th year of doing archaeology. Um, I've spent a lot of my career working in northern and western Canada, uh, splitting my time between studying uh, pre-contact Aboriginal culture or the archaeology of the fur trade. Um, people who are interested in, in archaeology as a career should probably be thinking about a mix of social sciences, humanities, and the physical sciences. Um, we need a lot of geography and geology in order to understand the environment that these folks are adapted to. We also need to understand history really well, both the passing of written history, but also the history that is part of the oral tradition among many indigenous societies. And finally, to do archaeology these days, you need to have a fairly solid background in the life sciences and the physical sciences. You need to have a good grounding in chemistry, in physics, in microscopy, in geochemistry, in biology, in geology, and so on and so on and so on. That's all the time we have for today, but thank you, Dr. Hamilton, for taking the time to talk to us and for answering all of our questions. It's been my pleasure. So next time on PIR live event, Dr. Jennifer Foote from Algoma University is joining us to teach us about bird migration. More information about these webinars and other PIR educational programs are available at PIRweb.org. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful day.